Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Parfait Elundu, and I stand in tonight for uh, Laurie Leonard, who is the director of the Paulson Institute for Global Development, and who is sponsoring uh, this event, along with the Mario Inaudi Center for International Studies, the Cornell Africana Studies and Research Center, the Economics Department, the Department of Government, and the Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future. The broad theme of tonight's lecture is about the importance of young people getting engaged in issues they care about in their communities. Uh, the conversation would be very specifically about the importance of civic engagement in the form of voting, regardless of political party or ideology. And in keeping with this theme, um, the lecture that we're going to have tonight was preceded by a voter registration event. Um, the registration event will continue after this uh, talk, uh, just outside this auditorium, under the leadership of the Vote Everywhere Coalition. For those who don't know what the voter, uh, Vote Everywhere Coalition is, it's a program that is supported by the Andrew Goodman Foundation, a foundation that was named after Andrew Goodman, who, along with James Earl Cheney and Cornelian Michael Schoener of class of 1961, were three civil rights workers who were killed by members of the Ku Klux Klan in the year 1964 just because they were registering voters in Mississippi. And so let me start by uh, inviting to stand and be recognized the members of this coalition, the Vote, the Vote Everywhere Coalition, if they're in the room. Could you stand and be recognized? Well, we're glad they're not here. Let me also, if they're in the room, uh, let me invite uh, to stand and be recognized alongside uh, the Andrew Goodman Fellows of Cornell, if they're in the room, or if they are outside, let's give, give them a hand. I also want to recognize um, uh, Aubryn Siddle of the Paulson Institute, who helped organize this event at the same time as Christian Elliott. Now to the hard stuff, uh, which is introducing the speaker. Uh, tonight's speaker, Jeffrey Sachs, is professor at Columbia University, where he directs this university's Center for Sustainable Development. I think it's safe to say that uh, our guest needs either no introduction at all, or a very introduction uh, if we are to go through most of his accomplishments. And because we only have an hour, I decided to cut to the chase and just give you three statistics that are going to be enough to give you a sense of his stature. And the first statistics I'm going to give you is three. And three is the number of UN Secretary Generals that Jeffrey has advised, starting with um, uh, Kofi Annan, then Ban Ki-moon, and now Antonio Guterres. So uh, that has to be some record. The second statistics is also three, and that is the number of times his books have appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. And interestingly, these books came at three years intervals. So he started in 2005 with the end of poverty, then 2008, Commonwealth, Economics for a Crowded Planet, then 2011, the price of civilization, and then something happened. It decided that a three-year interval was not fast enough, and so it moved to two-year interval. And so 2013, we have JFK's Quest for Peace, 2015, uh, we have uh, the Age of Sustainable Development, then 2017, building the new American economy. And so 
if you were following the track, the next book should be coming in 2019. But then he thought, well, 2019 is a little bit too far, so why don't I uh, produce that book right now? And so we have his next book coming up this year, as opposed to next, on October 2nd, um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to uh, look at the stack outside, it's already available to the Cornell community. It's a new foreign policy, um, and I have here my unsigned copy, <laughs> which I hope he will sign pretty soon, and I would invite you to uh, just avail yourself of one copy. So a pretty remarkable record uh, indeed. So the first statistic is three, the number of secretary general. The second statistic is three, the number of times on the New York Times bestseller list. And then the third statistic is is what? It's not three, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, here, I think it has slacked off a little bit. It's only two. And the statistic here is two, and it, that is the number of times he has been named to the Times Magazine's list of most influential people in the world. Okay? And when you review, when you read this book, as well as other books, you will understand why um, Jeffrey continues to be influential. His work is global in scope, it's broad in substance, and most importantly, it is always timely. And tonight's lecture, Reclaiming America's Democracy, is no exception. The lecture was focused on the importance of civic engagement in the American context and its implication for sustainable development. Now, even if the context tonight seems to be about the US, I think the topic of this lecture resonates globally. Over the next two months or so, about 25 countries in the world are going to have some kind of elections, uh, parliamentary, presidential elections. And in these elections, <coughs> the voices of young people should, in theory, loom large. But unfortunately, even in countries where young people have a clear demographic edge, that edge gets sometimes lost because of poor turnout. And so tonight, Jeffrey is going to tell us about how young people can and why they must gain, regain, or maintain their political edge. <clears throat> and so it is around that, that theme that both Jeff and the Vote Everywhere Coalition are joining forces tonight. And so with this, I'd like to welcome our speakers tonight, Jeffrey Sachs. be happy to sign that book. And thank you, Parfait, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, Cornell University, for the wonderful hospitality and for the occasion to launch the book uh, today and to also speak with you about issues that are really urgent for us. Uh, I hadn't realized that I had gone three year cycle uh, uh, and uh, then a two-year cycle, and now a one-year cycle, but if it shows anything, it surely shows my state of panic, uh, you know, that you better be writing now because uh, the crisis is, is building. And it is building. We're not in a safe place in our country or in the world. And I want to describe why I feel that way. I think we all probably are a little bit uh, nervous and shaken up by the state of our politics. It's bad and it's dangerous and we have to do something about it and you have to do something about it. Um, I'm going to vote tomorrow in the primary and I'm going to vote in the general election and if you do the same thing uh, we're going to be all right. And if you don't, the world's going to get more and more dangerous because we're not on a safe trajectory. And if we do not act in a timely way, you don't know when the chance is uh, going to be lost and how dangerous things can become. And this is both our immediate 
crisis and, I feel, a metaphor. Uh, it is our media crisis because this is the satellite picture of Hurricane Florence bearing down on the southeast coast of the United States. It's a mega storm, as a lot of the hurricanes have been in recent years. That's not coincidental. They are being powered by human-induced climate change. They are being made a lot more dangerous by rising sea levels. The warm waters in the Atlantic give energy to these hurricanes, so the frequency of high-intensity hurricanes is rising. The amount of precipitation associated with them rises because warmer air holds more moisture. So the physics are not all unraveled, but fairly clear that this is a danger. The governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, said today that it is disaster at the doorstep. This will make landfall tomorrow or the next day. <clears throat> and when it does, there will without doubt be a lot of suffering. We don't know how much suffering, but it could be calamitous. It could be a lucky avoidance of worse. We don't know, but it will be a lot of suffering. And it's disaster at the doorstep. But this is also a metaphor because we are facing not just a big storm, but we're facing a building calamity worldwide. We're facing the calamity of climate change that is not only not in control, but with the president doing everything he can to make matters worse as rapidly and dramatically as possible. I will explain a little bit about his psychopathy later. Uh, this is not a normal person, but we are in a dangerous place. And what that storm represents is both the literal fact of an environmental crisis that is getting worse, and it represents also a global crisis more generally of unsustainability, injustice, inequality, lack of care for the future that is getting worse. And that's a big storm building. And we have to do something about it. We know how devastating these physical uh, manifestations of human intensified uh, climate dangers are. This is the aftermath of last year's hurricanes, just one year ago uh, that Hurricane Maria tore through the Caribbean and uh, did untold damage, especially in Puerto Rico, which is not even close to having recovered from the storm a year ago. It will be years and years of misery from that storm. And indeed, last year, just a short time ago, it was three mega hurricanes that hit in about six weeks. First uh, hitting Texas, then hitting Florida, then tearing through the Caribbean. And then a few weeks after that, less than a year ago, was forest fire spreading through California so that within about eight weeks, four specific events left behind thousands dead and $300 billion of losses. And we're only at the start of this damage because things are going to get worse no matter what we do from the mere fact of physics. We have built in a lot of warming that has not yet shown up by the emissions of greenhouse gases to date. With the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the planet has already warmed 
by about 1.1 degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial temperature. But because the oceans take time to warm, like a bathtub that takes time to heat up, there's a lot of uh, heat capacity in the ocean. So even when you have an energy imbalance, the land warms up faster than the oceans. We have already built in perhaps another half a degree Celsius warming that is already on track just with the emissions to date. But we are not stopping the human-caused damage, so a lot more is to come. Well, this hurricane devastated Puerto Rico, and our idiot-in-chief went down and threw paper towels uh, through to uh, the people and declared what a wonderful thing he had done as his, his broken record. And he said this yesterday, well, I think Puerto Rico was incredibly successful. And then he said, uh, well, it's an island, so it's hard. Well, duh. And then he said, and I actually think it was one of the best jobs that's ever been done with respect to what this is all about. As if he had a clue as to what this is all about. Because what has recent evidence uncovered, not what was announced in the days after the storm, but the careful epidemiological evidence that has come out in the last couple of months. Well, it has been found in one study that 3,000 people died in this catastrophe. It was a, initially said 86 had died. But if you look at the excess deaths that came in the weeks after this because the electricity was out, because people couldn't get health care, because people couldn't get their medicines, because there was no emergency response. One study found that 3,000 people died. A study at Harvard University found that 5,000 people died in the event of the storm. And what does the president say yesterday in the face of this evidence? Well, I think Puerto Rico was incredibly successful. This is not normal. President Trump apparently was told by his daddy that there are killers and there are losers. So be a killer. And he has achieved his goal. People are dying on this watch because we are not taking seriously the realities that we face. We don't understand the menaces that have been unleashed, and we are playing games, fellow Americans, games with our future. But I have to tell you, especially your future, the young people, because what is building is a massive storm over your generation. And Trump hasn't a clue, and the minions around him don't give a damn. And that's about politics. And that's why this matters, and that this is no joke. So here we have uh, the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster, another one of these minions. He orders his state to close down the schools and the facilities because of the emergency. And where was Mr. McMaster last year? He's standing there proudly with President Trump supporting the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement. This is not a man keeping his state safe. This is not a man keeping you safe. And what he said when he announced his support, he said, I'm with Trump. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We'll be OK. We will not be OK in these people's hands. 
This is not democracy, and this is not governance that you need and that I need. This is willful denial of our safety. And it's going to get worse for you. And you've got to do something about it. It's interesting how broken our politics are. That's why I want you and myself and all of us to work together to reclaim our democracy. If we had a working democracy in the sense of aggregating public opinion or aggregating especially our needs so that we can thrive as a country and as a world, we would take note of a map something like this. This is a survey done by a research center at Yale University asking state by state, do you support participating in the Paris Climate Agreement? You'll notice blue means less than half support the Paris Climate Agreement. And in this uh, coloring, uh, beige to red means support the Paris Climate Agreement. So take a look at the blue states first the places where a majority does not support the Paris Climate Agreement. You got that? You notice this big geographic divide in our country? You see that strong base of support for Mr. Trump and pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement? No, you don't, because it doesn't exist. This is not about the views of the American people. This is about something else that is a lot more broken. It's about this. These are the campaign contributions. In this cycle from the oil and gas industry. Of course, you know the name at the top, Coke Industries. Things go crummy with Coke. The Koch brothers, they have bought up the Republican Party. They've worked at it. They started with perhaps $30 billion each a decade ago. Then they got up to $50 billion with a few tens of millions of investment to buy up our politicians, who come cheap, by the way. And now, with the tax cuts paid for by you, because those tax cuts last year are now causing deficits of $1 trillion a year. And may I ask you who's going to pay off those debts? Not the octogenarians and the septuagenarians that voted for their greed, but you guys. This is on you, thank you very much. But now the Koch brothers are worth $60 billion each. So it's a good investment by the Republican Party. And you can see the shading of the oil and gas purchases. Blue is for Democrats. Red is for the Republicans or the conservative PACs. I'm not especially partisan, by the way, but I'm telling you something's really wrong. Something is dangerously wrong, and it's on you. And then you got your congressman here. What a story, representing this district Tom Reed, who stands lockstep with Mr. Trump and the corruption of the Republican Party, and absolutely clarified, I had to reread it twice. Take off the glasses, rub your eyes, look at it again, because he ran out to clarify there was a misprint 
early on after Trump pulled out that said that Reid opposed the pullout and he had to send his spokesman to say, no, no, I stand completely with the president. And this phony says that he's part of a bipartisan coalition for ruin because this is the policy that is going to break this country and they're doing everything possible, I can tell you, diplomatically to break the global agreement because if the United States is maximizing the emissions from coal, oil, and gas, why should the other countries participate in this collective action problem globally? So they're out to break the whole agreement by starting with the example and I was shocked that any New York congressman, especially one, after all, with one of the greatest universities in the world and one of the greatest climatology and earth science departments of a land-grant university specializing in this area, would dare to represent this community this way. These people are endangering us. This is no joke. And Mr. Reed, oh my God, it was much worse than I knew. 7% environmental record. What a phony. In a rural district that depends on the resilience of agriculture, that represents this university campaigning relentlessly to destroy environmental protection and to destroy the basic architecture of saving ourselves from the Hurricane Florences and the Hurricane Marias and the other disasters that are looming. He's your congressman. I don't feel safe. We cannot be represented by this kind of behavior and think that this is normal or prudent or safe for you. We do have a problem. Our society is deeply divided, though on the Paris Climate Agreement question, it's actually not even divided. But we do have a divided country right now. It is notable, by the way, that it's divided to an important extent along educational lines. And if you look at how the 2016 vote went, which is shown on the right, and on the proportion of each state's population with an advanced degree, you'll find a striking correlation. Actually, simply the proportion of 25 to 34 year olds with a BA or higher explains about 70% of the cross state variation in the 2016 vote. So Trump supporters are in states with unfortunately low levels of education low levels of innovation, places where the economy is hurt and held back by the lack of dynamism, of uh, innovation, and uh, therefore hurt. And Trump claims that he's going to represent those people. But what he's going to do is bring on more disaster. <laughs> It's a game. The game is a game of corruption. More for the rich, more for the oil industry, more debt for the young, more debt for the future, more climate disaster on the way. And that's what we're facing. So I want to come back to a basic idea, which is uh, really good idea. It was an idea 2,350 years ago. And with all respect to the political scientists in the room, it's the best book on political science ever written. 
It's called The Politics. It was the first book on political science ever written in the West by Aristotle. And he had a very basic point about politics. It's the opening page of the politics. He says, since we see that every city-state is a sort of community and that every community is established for the sake of some good, it is clear that every community aims at some good and the community which has the most authority of all and includes all the other aims, all the others aims the highest. In other words, he said that the purpose of politics was the human good. It wasn't the re-election of an incumbent. It wasn't the fantasies of a psychopath. It wasn't Machiavelli's struggle for power. It is our well-being. That's what politics is about. We don't necessarily believe that now. We're awfully cynical. We're not even taught that necessarily. We're sometimes taught that politics is the struggle for power. But politics done right is the expression of the collective interest for the common good. And that's the test I suggest we ask ourselves about the American political system, about your representatives and my representatives, about our president, and about the state of the world. Are our politics organized for the common good? They can be, they should be, but of course, oops, they are not. That was not lights out just yet. But we are on life support. I'm an old guy now. I've lived through a lot of presidents. I was born during Eisenhower's administration. Can you imagine? That's like ancient history. So I've seen a lot of presidents. I remember John F. Kennedy campaigning. And I've seen Nixon, who was awful. And I've seen Reagan, who had a touch of dementia at the end of his administration. Not a great thing for world safety. And I've seen George Bush, who I thought was the worst I could ever imagine. And now I've seen the worst that I couldn't imagine. <laughs> and I've seen and felt the deterioration of our democratic ideas and practices and how fragile our circumstances are now. I don't know if it's right, but I fear that November is of fundamental importance, that either this president is checked or we could risk losing everything. I think it's nothing less than that. And I see several profound crises before our eyes, not only the disaster at the door of Hurricane Florence. First, our president is ill. He is severely impaired with an antisocial personality disorder traits, extreme narcissism, extreme sadism, many things that have been true of other world leaders. He is, in more vernacular parlance, psychopathic. That is not a good place to put a psychopath in the Oval Office. And while it's not popular to say and it's not pleasant to say, and I'm not saying it because it's a game or a joke or lighthearted or because I'm a partisan or because I'm running for office, I'm telling you 
we are in danger. And that's what people are trying to tell you every day now, whether it's the op-ed in the New York Times last week or these books appearing. This is not normal. This is not prudent. This is not safe. But he is unchecked in almost everything. The only check right now on Trump is the court system. Because with two houses of Congress in the hands of a corrupt political party, we are getting no constraint at all on the president. The politicians are not keeping us even physically safe. When Trump says yesterday, it was great, he means it, first of all, because he is delusional. This is part of what narcissism is about. He is incapable of recognizing the evidence. He is a compulsive liar, but also to himself. But it means that our institutions are not protective of us. And our foreign policy is not protective. And I fear we could be in conflict because he is also surrounded by dangerous people. Not accidentally. He has picked them. The US is in perpetual war. Please understand this. We have been in nonstop war for at least a generation. But as I describe in this book, we've basically been at nonstop war from the start. But our first hundred years of war as a country was the genocides against Native Americans. So it was war basically on our own continent. But it was perpetual war and glorified war because every victory was a proof of our provident blessings. Every destruction of other nations was a proof of our blessings. And we arrived at the 19, 1890s. Ah, we had defeated everybody. A continent of genocides. And so what new? What now? And that, of course, was the war of choice of 1898. Time for us to get some overseas colonies. Bad luck. One of them is Puerto Rico. No good to be a colony slammed by a hurricane. No one gives a damn. And the United States began its adventures internationally. One of the things we became addicted to as the most powerful country in the world was regime change. Most countries, when they have foreign policies, they try to figure out how to deal with other countries. America, when it has what it calls foreign policy, is how to overthrow governments we don't like. And so we got in the business of overthrowing governments, especially in the Western Hemisphere for the first 50 years of the last century. And then we really reached global standards, and so we started to overthrow governments everywhere in the world. Southeast Asia, Central America, Africa, and every time a true native leader reared up, like Mr. Lumumba, who thought that maybe the copper belonged to the people of Africa, not to the miners of Belgium, they got a bullet through the head from the CIA. And so we've been at this for a long time. But it's getting worse, by the way. So since 1990, we've been basically, actually, since 1979, we've been at nonstop war. In 1979, we thought we would do something clever send in the CIA, start vi and hire some jihadist mercenaries, and uh, try to instigate an invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union to get them stuck. Conscious policy. 
which 40 years later has left Afghanistan completely destroyed. The culture, the society, the millions of people who have been maimed or died in a nonstop US effort that American people don't even know about, by the way, don't understand because we've also been told it was them, they did it, it's the Taliban's fault and so forth, but without the history and the background. And in the Middle East, how many of you appreciate that the so-called Syrian civil war was an American-led regime change operation against Assad that went wrong because it turned out Assad had friends, the Russians and the Iranians. And we blame them for the war. We started the war. In that case, President Obama even told us, Assad must go. And so we signed a presidential order to overthrow a foreign government through covert operations with the Saudi Arabians, it failed. That was 2011. We are seven years later. 10 million people have been displaced, at least half a million dead. And there's now a bloodbath, another one on the way in the northeast province of Idlib because we're still backing the rebels, so-called. By what principle? to overthrow someone else's government. So that's a country that is on, whose democracy is on life support because to have endless war, you give the power to the executive and you make secrecy a centerpiece of politics. We can't even know what's going on in foreign policy except if you hear it from the inside because it's all secret. We have a secret army called the CIA, and it is deployed all over the world. It's very serious. Well, the Republicans like their money, that's for sure. Mr. Koch, both David and Charles, like their money. Six, 50 billion wasn't enough, they needed tax cuts. So now it's 60 billion. Aren't you happy for them? And you're paying for it because our budget deficit is now $900 billion. And who is going to be paying off that debt in the future? Please raise your hand. Yep, all of you guys. Please ask Congressman Reed, why did he put the burden of debt on you? What did you do to him? And they want more even. He announced today, Mr. Reed, we need another round of tax cuts, another $2 trillion of deficit. I'm a macroeconomist that for a while spent most of my time cleaning up financial catastrophes. I helped Bolivia end a hyperinflation 33 years ago, and I helped Poland end a hyperinflation 29 years ago, and I did that in a lot of countries. I know what it's like when governments go bankrupt. And this is what your politicians are doing to you right now. To all of you under my age. Doesn't matter for me, but it sure matters for you. This is debt on your heads and they want to do even more because greed is an addiction and it's a very powerful one. Aristotle also told us that in the Nicomachean Ethics, if you have read that, my favorite book. We don't need the greed and we don't need the politicians that wallow in it. You know, many of you are on student loans. The debt has now reached one and a half trillion dollars we're the only rich society that creates a generation of debtors of you. It's inhuman, but why? Because other countries don't have tuitions of $50,000 or more. 
they have public policies, they pay for it. How do they pay for it? They tax the people more, especially the rich people and the companies. And you don't end up with a generation in debt. U.S. inequality is at an all-time high. Mr. Bezos, who fought hard against a homeless tax in Seattle, in Amazon's hometown, who's now scouring the country, getting cities to give tax rebates and land for Amazon to build its HQ2, Mr. Bezos personally is worth $163 billion right now. One person. It's unbelievable what we are allowing in this country. Unbelievable. I could not have imagined it in my early years. I told one of you as I was signing books earlier that I decided very self-consciously, very self-aware in the 1970s I was going to work on international problems because I said to myself, America, we're okay. The real problems are abroad. I could not have imagined the collapse of decency and of our political institutions that would allow this to happen. Life expectancy has declined during the last two years now. Declined. Why? Opioid addiction, suicides, mass depression. We're the only high-income country with declining life expectancy. Is someone looking out for the common good? Have you heard a great solution for the opioid epidemic? Did you read the recent discovery, discovery for me, that Purdue Pharmaceutical, which fueled the opioid epidemic, the Sackler family, actually secretly owned the second producer of opioids. That was just disclosed a couple of days ago through some investigative reporting. Our companies are being deregulated. They're allowed to get away with murder, literally, because this is murder. Suicides, depressions, and substance abuse are all in epidemic proportions. And the US is out to make war right now abroad, not only in the Middle East, but we're trying to stoke up as much tension with China as possible because China has the audacity to be growing, developing, and achieving high levels of technological excellence. And so for US primacists, those who believe we have to be the only ones on top, that is somehow a profound worry. And that's what's driving Mr. Trump. The only problem is our true existential fate, as President Kennedy put it with miraculous eloquence in his inaugural address. For man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. The stakes are too high for these games. In this technological age, we could solve every one of these problems. But instead, we are stoking every one of these problems because our politics are not representing us. We do not have Aristotelian politics. We have Machiavellian politics. We have thuggish politics. The doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is now two minutes to midnight. This is the closest to disaster since the inauguration of this clock, since the unleashing of thermonuclear weapons in 1953. So how does our politics work? Let me just put it in four quick terms. First, we are dominated by corporate lobbies, the one that paid Mr. Reed's bills. 
And these are four basic powerful interests in the US. Wall Street, the arms industry, big oil, and big health care. I say big health care because it's a monopoly racket. It's 18% of GDP, and we're getting gouged. We pay twice for health care what, what every other country pays. So watch the vested interests, how powerful they are. Big oil said, get out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The arms industry, happy with war. Wall Street, endless financial speculation. Healthcare, the costs keep rising because that's by design. No one will touch it, at least no one like your congressman. We have suppression of voter registration and voter turnout. This is key. How many of you here are American citizens not yet registered to vote? Please raise your hand and be honest because I don't believe you. <laughs> if you're not registered, raise your hand high, please. Just one? Register him. <laughs> OK. I hope you got it right. But please vote and drag in your friends to vote. It's no joke. Vote when you can, because you don't know if the next time you won't be able to. We're in trouble. If you're not registered but didn't want to raise your hand, do it tonight, please. The way our system works is that in every opinion survey, the bulk of the American people are on side for normal things because most Americans are quite normal, thank you. But that's not the policies we're getting. And that's because of vested interests who own the Congress, who vote against the public interest, but it's also because people don't vote. Mr. Trump got elected. We don't exactly know how. We're still waiting to hear more. But he, we know that he got around 27% of the voting population vote. That is not workable for us. Half the country didn't vote. Most of those express opinions strongly against what this man stands for, but they didn't vote. Now we're in trouble. So this is a third part of the system, believe me, or a second part of the system. The Republicans know it. They have been actively suppressing voter registration across the United States, but you still have a chance until October 12th. So there's one person who's going to register. But for all the others who did not get their hands raised, or at least check where you're going to vote and make sure that you get your ballot in. The third trick is to put it on you. We have lost control of any delayed gratification in our politics. So the septuagenarians and octogenarians are cashing in, and they're leaving you the bill. And that's what the tax cuts are about. And that's the booming stock market. Aren't you happy? Aren't you, don't you feel great that the stock market's up? That's capitalizing the tax cuts. But you don't own stock, not very much of it. You own the debt. You'll see it in the future. That's how it works. At some point, we'll stop the game, and then the debt servicing will start, and then the taxes will go up not to buy public services, but to pay the debt. That will be on you. So better to stop it now. And I'm afraid that international politics is gangsterism now. Because so much is war and so much is covert. And Mr. Trump, you may have noticed, doesn't like the rule book. 
Never did. It's part of psychopathy. He believes the rules don't apply to him. And now he believes the rules don't apply to the United States. So he's tearing up all the rules. I work at the UN. The UN is the basis for international law. But every day I hear the United States government saying, we don't believe in international law. We don't care what the UN says. We don't care what the UN Security Council says. Because they think like a battle of the mafia families that the US will win this one. But there is no winning globally. There is only violence if we go down this path. So this, I'm afraid, is where we are right now. We still have our Constitution. We still have elections. We still have a chance. But it is extraordinarily fragile. Please understand this, how fragile this is, and how badly it's malfunctioning right now. This is a graph of voter turnout in the high-income countries. The arrow points to the United States. You can't read the, read the country list. But we're one of the lowest voter turnout countries in the world among the democracies. And that is, again, by design. Who doesn't vote? Young people and poor people and African-American people and other minorities because the registration is harder than hell in many states. Fortunately, not so hard in New York that you can't do it. But they're trying to make it as hard as possible and as inconvenient as possible. And they're succeeding. So thank you to the Andrew Goodman Foundation. and. Uh, you have only one client left here, but I want you to go get your friends and make sure that they're registered also and get their friends and remind them how critical the November election is. Now, let me turn briefly to what we ought to be doing. What would Aristotelian politics really be about? What would politics for the common good really be about? In two words, sustainable development. What does it mean? It means being prosperous, but also fair and environmentally sustainable. That's all it means. Of course, we want prosperity, but we want some social justice, not Mr. Bezos, with its tax breaks and $163 billion of personal wealth, and then people who can't pay the bills, can't pay for their medicines, and with our right-wing Congress trying to cut the poorest people off from any kind of help. That's not sustainable development. Nor is it sustainable to development to deny climate science and then every year face more intense hurricanes and then have thousands die, and then say, we did a great job. That is not sustainable development. So the world agreed on 17 sustainable development goals. Even the United States, of course, it was during the presidency of Barack Obama. All 193 countries in the UN agreed on these goals. To end poverty, to move to renewable energy, to fight climate change, to protect biodiversity. That's our future. That's the common good. That's what our politics should be about. And I really like this guy. He was my first president. And he was a great leader. And he put big challenges in front of Americans. And this is the moment he was challenging Americans to go to the moon. Pretty cool, by the way. That's how I spent my childhood, from age 7 to 15, watching the moonshot. And it was really exciting for our country. And he had, he had a lot of uh, audacity 
Uh, President Kennedy said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Our politicians don't talk like that anymore. They don't talk about great challenges and great goals, and they certainly don't tell you that it'll be hard and expensive. But when President Kennedy said it, the whole country stood up and said, yes, we should do this. And unbelievably, eight years later, this task was accomplished, miraculously. When President Kennedy said this, they didn't know how to do it. It took NASA 18 months to come up with a basic plan. We have our own moonshot now. We have to decarbonize the energy system. We have to stop the loss of biodiversity. We have to ensure that in an age of artificial intelligence and wonderful new forms of automation that we have a society that is fair and democratic and so that we can govern our technologies rather than our technologies governing us. So we have our own moonshot. But we don't have leaders telling us all these great things. We have a president trying to drag us back into the 20th century with fossil fuels, with coal, into the 19th century pre-UN era of cooperation. We need 21st century moonshots. You guys have to do that. We need bold goals. And we can do incredible things now. The technologies have never been stronger, of course. It's amazing that that picture of Hurricane Florence that I showed you at the beginning, you can see the International Space Station there. It's itself a technological miracle to take that picture and to be able to track this hurricane so precisely. But that's the technology we have right now also for protecting biodiversity, for stopping deforestation, stopping illegal fishing, which is destroying the oceans, for making the transformation to safe energy systems. This is our moonshot. It would actually be fun. And it's all within reach. And we're blowing it completely. This is what we're doing. See all those dots? Those are American military bases. This is crazy. We have more than 700 military bases around the world. That is not keeping you safe. That is making the world extraordinarily dangerous. That is the idea of American exceptionalism. This book describes why this idea is dangerous, wrong, absolutely anachronistic. Either we learn to be nice friends with others, or we're going to get ourselves into complete, calamitous self-destruction. Because we're not going to win these wars, and we're not going to remain the dominant country when America is 4.4% of the world's population, thank you. And every other country has the right to develop and the desire to develop. And all these military bases around the world are not going to keep us safe. They're going to bankrupt us first. And where America stands relative to other high-income countries, on every dimension, poverty, almost the highest. Obesity rate, number one. And by the way, that's because we have an absolutely unregulated industry, food industry, which is killing Americans. That is part of our corporatocracy. Thank you, Coca-Cola. Thank you, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Thank you, McDonald's. You've done it. 40% obesity in the United States. And this is causing havoc in people's lives, causing depression, causing cardiovascular disease, causing a lot of suffering 
and it's an industrial-induced disorder, unlike this in any other part of the high-income world. The place next to us is Mexico, because that was the easiest place to get hooked on sugar beverages. Life expectancy, now one of the lowest in the high-income world. Is that Aristotelian politics? No, it isn't. This is the share of women in politics. This is probably the single key. Elect women. You have a terrific candidate, Tracy Metrano. running against a bum. <laughs> Come on, do your thing. This is a big, important community in this district. Get the women elected. We'll finally get somewhere. <laughs> we are, as you know, about the highest emitter of carbon dioxide, but not quite high enough for Mr. Trump. But we're emitting nearly 17 tons of CO2 per person in the United States. It's a disaster for the world, and it is out of control. Ah, you can barely see that, but when we rank the U.S. on progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals, we're just about at the bottom of the high-income world. Just about at the bottom of the high-income world. Just about the worst. Because our politics are now the worst in the high-income world. Corrupt and absolutely out to get us, not out for our safety. And that picture you can't see at all. So let me conclude with a great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln really a good one. He signed the Morrill Act, as you know well, at Cornell. The Morrill Act is one of the moral acts of our country also, if I could put it that way. Because the Morrill Act, which established the concept of land-grant universities, was a moral act in Aristotle's sense of saying that knowledge is for the common good and in the middle of the Civil War, they took the time to say, we need to establish institutes of higher learning for the common good. And here we are in one of the greatest of all, and one of the greatest in the world. And this is, for me, vital for reclaiming American democracy. And I will remind you of this university's mission to discover, preserve, and disseminate knowledge to educate the next generation of global citizens and to promote a culture of broad inquiry throughout and beyond the Cornell community. Cornell also aims through public service to enhance the lives and livelihoods of students, the people of New York, and others around the world. So I believe that this challenge of sustainable development is fundamentally a challenge for us. And the universities and great universities like Cornell and many others in this neighborhood can play an extraordinarily important role. And indeed, it's the only way that we're going to get this done. It is knowledge for the common good. And now you have the knowledge, you're gaining the knowledge and expertise, but you know also the stakes that we face. And I want to end with the idea of the common good at the global scale, because this is really, at the end of the day, the measure of whether we choose to end all forms of human poverty or whether we choose advertently or inadvertently ending all forms of human life. 
because it will come down to the question of global cooperation. Look in this community, this wonderful community. You have people from all over the world here. We're all working together. We're working with common understanding, a common language of seeking truth, and a common ethic of cooperation. And that is the key for us to be able to achieve the fundamental aim of sustainable development. And President Kennedy in this speech in June 1963 showed me, at least uh, gave for me the most vivid understanding of how it is possible in a divided world still to find the common cause. And what President Kennedy was doing in this speech was trying to pull the world back from the nuclear brink of the Cuban Missile Crisis by saying and realizing we can't go on this way, we will destroy everything. And so he appealed in this speech for peace with the Soviet Union. And he did it in the most miraculous way, not saying to the Soviet Union, you must do this, this, and this, but saying to the American people, this depends on us changing our attitudes towards our counterparts. If we believe peace is impossible, we will lose it all in a self-fulfilling prophecy of doom. If we understand that our counterparts are also human beings that want the same as we do, we can find a way to peace. And he made this marvelous speech, which I'd like to assign to all of you to look at online. It's the speech on June 10, 1963, the American University Commencement Address. It's gorgeous. It's unbelievable. I drove my kids nuts for a year. I think I made them watch it 50 times. Uh, Dad, stop, we already saw it. But President Kennedy said in this speech something that I just want to close with because he gave the idea of how it is possible to reach global cooperation. And he said, so let us not be blind to our differences but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much.